Well, good evening. Welcome to our Sunday evening Bible time. I'm hoping you've got something with your Bible on it or you have your Bible close uh, as we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. You know, most newspapers have special writers who all they do is compose headlines. And like in anything else, some are better than others because headlines can sometimes be, well, quite funny. Let me give you a couple of headlines that I've seen over the last few years. One says, Grandmother of Eight Makes a Hole in One. Police begin campaign to run down Jay Walkers. Dealers will hear car talk at noon. Two sisters renite after 18 years at the checkout counter. <laughs> Juvenile court try juvenile court to try shooting defendants. I don't know if that's a really good thing. Man missing ear waves hearing. Hospital sued by seven foot doctors. You know, when you read those, if you don't have the correct punctuation in there, you're not really going to know what you're talking about. And there are some funny headlines and and, and this is an actual headline from New York on Halloween of 1938. This is what it said. Radio listeners in panic taking war drama as fact. The next line says, many flee homes to escape gas raid from Mars. All of this hysteria was created by a radio broadcast in which Orson Welles um, was reading his book, War of the World. On the night before Halloween, 12 million Americans were listening to the Mercury Theater on the air. And as part of that drama, dance music was interrupted several times by fake music bulletins reporting a huge flaming object had dropped um, onto a farm near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. An actor playing the reporter described it with the, the scene of the spacecraft with, this word, with these words. He said... There's something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now there's another one, and another one. They look like tentacles to me. I can see the thing's body. It's as large as a bear, and it glistens like wet leather. But that face, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. Its eyes are black and gleam like a serpent. Its mouth is V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips that seem to quiver and pulsate. Now, could you imagine sitting there listening to the radio in 1938? Quite frankly, that was long before my favorite Martian or Mork and Mindy or Third Rock from the Sun. A lot of you <laughs> uh, listening will remember those television shows. Uh, long before Star Wars or Star Trek ever was thought of, and people across America thought the news bulletins were actually real. Thousands of people panicked. And they took to the highways to flee that part of the country. They hid in cellars and wrapped their heads in wet towels to protect themselves from the poisonous gases. They really thought, they really believed that the aliens had landed. Some have noted his broadcast was the first example of how the media could be used to confuse or sway an entire nation. That broadcast in 1938 was a fictional account. But according to this word, aliens are alive and well on planet, planet Earth. When we started teaching through the book of 1 Peter, I entitled the series Aliens. And it was based on this passage because I believe this passage to be the key passage in understanding the entire letter. A glance at verses 9 and 10. Well, we're reminded that our reason for existence is to declare the praises of God. In verse 11, it represents a transition in the book. Up to this point, Peter's been dealing with doctrinal issues. And now he's going to take that doctrine and apply it in practical directions in our lives in which we are directed to live. He identifies us as aliens. Look at verse 11 
of First Peter chapter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that war against you. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that in, a, in case where they speak against you as those who do evil, they may, by observing your good works, glorify God in a day of visitation. In a day of visitation. Eugene Peterson says, Friends, this world is not your home. Don't make yourself cozy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life among the nation, natives so that your actions will refute their prejudices. And then there won't be... Uh, and then they'll be one to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. Four important things to understand quickly this evening. First, we are aliens. What do you, what do you think of when you hear that word? I mean, some people imagine a cute little spaceman on a flying saucer. Others have nightmares of, of the scary uh, version like uh, the movie Aliens or maybe the lovable E.T. riding the bicycle over the trees and across the moon. Maybe television series like X-Files or movies like Signs all testify that we are fascinated with the possibility of not being alone in this universe. I've been asked before if I believe there's intelligent life on other planets. My response usually is this, I'm not sure there's intelligent life on planet Earth. Now whether there's intelligent life on other planets or not is not the point of this passage. The Bible says all of us are aliens who are followers of Jesus. We, we are aliens to the rest of this world. When we were born the first time, we were born into this world. This is a world that you can see, you can smell, you can taste, you can hear, you can feel. The senses are covered. But when you and I experienced a spiritual rebirth, we were born again into a new world. From that moment, we belong to a different world. We no longer should feel at home in this world. There are two kinds of people who are living on this rock, the natives and the aliens. The natives are those who live for this world. The aliens are the ones who live here, but we recognize there is another world that we live for. And if we are aliens in this world, then where are we from? Our real home, Philippians 3.20, Paul says we are citizens of a high heaven. And we are waiting on the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like his own. We live here, but this isn't our home. That's why we never totally feel at home in this world. Heaven is our true home. We reside in this world, but we don't belong here. Secondly, we're in a war of the worlds. We're in a war of the worlds. Not only are we aliens, but we are involved in a war. The original natives of this planet were placed to live in goodness and in kindness and to take care of the creation that God had created. But yet they rebelled against the Creator. And they started living self-centered lives. And because we are aliens, we live in a world hostile to our way of thinking. C.S. Lewis described it this way. This universe is at war. It is a civil war of rebellion. And we are living in part of the universe occupied by the rebels. Enemy occupied territory. That's what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say landed in disguise and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. When you go to church, you're listening in to the secret wireless uh, message from our friends. And this is why the enemy is so anxious to prevent us from going. During World War II, Americans spoke about fighting the war on three fronts. There was the European front that stopped the spread of Nazism. There was the war in the Pacific Theater against Imperial Japan, but many people who were members of the greatest generation speak of fighting the war on the home front. People like Rosie the Riveter, 
those men and women that were not fighting on the other two fronts, who were protecting and, and, and helping those who were, whether it was working in the factories or it was enduring the rationing of, of foods and blackouts. In our spiritual war, we battle on three fronts. We battle the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world is that external flow. The flesh is our internal foe. And the devil, well, he's our infernal foe. And in this passage, we look at two fronts in this war. First, there's a personal war that's being fought within my soul. Peter writes in verse 11, We must abstain from sinful desires which war against our soul. When we were born, we were equipped with this full set of sinful desires and lusts. When we were born again, we became aliens. But guess what? Those sinful desires aren't surgically removed. So it's a constant battle. It's a battle of evil desires that take place in our soul. Our soul has been redeemed and changed. And these desires continue to, to try to sabotage our lives. What do we do? We abstain. That means we don't give in to them. Life is a constant series of battles. You want to lie. You want to steal. You want to gossip. You want to hurt people. It is a battle that takes place in your soul. But when you abstain against it, that's the only way you win. But the war goes on. Secondly, it's a cultural war. It's fought within our nation. Just as our sinful flesh constantly places wicked desires in our minds, the world um, without God is constantly trying to influence us to give in to its way of thinking. The battle that we are facing as Americans is a determined uh, moral to determine moral standards for our culture. We are we are losing. We have vocal active groups out there who have pushed for and saw the approval from everything from abortion on demand to same sex marriage. And they claim it is their right under the U.S. Constitution. But it's interesting to me that the founders of our nation, they did speak of rights. And they said this, that there, that there are truths that are self-evident. That we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To most of us, their reference to the Creator offers a very strong argument that there is a belief that God is the source of all of our rights. And if that is true, then they have some, uh, they, they, they had to have some source of understanding, our founding fathers that is, of this Creator. I mean, any student of history will admit that from the very beginning of the nation, the Bible was used as our moral authority. The Greek poet Homer wrote the thrilling tale of how the Greek armies launched a thousand ships to rescue Helen from Troy. Helen was said to have the face that launched 10,000 ships. Ten years the Greek armies tried to capture Troy and they were turned back repeatedly. Finally, Odysseus came up with an ingenious plan. They built this large wooden hollow horse. The famous horse would be referred to as the Trojan horse. And several of the mighty Greek warriors hid inside of that horse. And then all the Greek soldiers got on their ships and sailed away. And the residents of Troy assumed that they surrendered, that the horse was an offering of peace. And so they brought the Trojan horse inside their gates. And they began to party and celebrate their victory. And while they were sleeping in a drunken stupor, the Greek soldiers slipped out of the wooden horse they killed the sentries and they opened the gates to the army that had sailed right back. And this led to the fall of Troy. The same thing has happened in America, folks. We've welcomed a Trojan horse of morality to be brought into our homes through things like the media. 
Should you and I be surprised that there's confusion about what marriage is since over the past 20 years we've watched sitcoms with every possible combination imaginable? And while the church has been asleep, these forces have taken over America. America, wake up. Make no mistake about it, we're in a war. And it is a, as real a war as what we've had over the last 20-something years in Iraq and Afghanistan. Every time you heard about an explosion over there, it's a reminder that there's war taking place here. Every time you hear about something going on over there, it's also a sign of display of how we've dealt with the Ten Commandments or public prayer or abortion or homosexuality. It's a culture war that's happening in this country. We've arrived at a place where those who claim the Bible to be the basis for our truth are labeled as narrow-minded, intolerant, and intellectual Neanderthals, bigots. We're going to be hated for our biblical stance, but don't worry. Be of good cheer. Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. We're in a war of the worlds. The issue is, are we going to live by the standards of this world, or are we going to recognize the moral standards of our Creator? In a war, we, the war that we are in, we are alien warriors. But don't be despair, because the war, the battle, is the Lord's. And we have a secret weapon. You know, in those space movies, the aliens usually employ some secret weapon like a ray gun or something like that. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we aren't fighting against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness. Our weapons are the Word of God. That is the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith. And we wield these weapons in prayer. That is our secret weapon. Our secret weapon can speed to any spot on the planet at the speed of thought. Our weapon, our only weapon against the world, against the flesh, against the devil, is the one weapon that can't be resisted in heaven, and that's prayer. A prayer prayed in faith based on the Word of God. We are aliens on a mission. We're not just here to make time until we die and return to our Creator. The third thing I'd like you to see this evening is we have a mission to accomplish. We have a job. You've heard that corny line from some of the space movies. The aliens are approaching some suspecting earthlings and they say, take us to your leader. Our mission is just that. As aliens, our job is to take the natives to our leader. We are not tourists. Our job is to help the native earthlings become aliens like us. Peter says the best way to do that is not hit them over the head with our doctrine, but to convince them by living different lives. Our mission is to show a world a different life form, a different way of living. The native earthlings curse those who curse them, but we pray for those who curse us. The native earthlings seek revenge over those who hurt them. As aliens, we forgive those who have wronged us. Our challenge is to live in this world without becoming a part of the thinking and the lifestyles of this world. We are to be in this world, but we're not to be of this world. The only business that we have in the world is to win the world. Christians in this fallen world are like a boat in the water. You see, boats are built to be in the water. But the boat is not supposed to be, but the water is not supposed to be in the boat. If the water gets in the boat, it's going to sink. In that same way, you and I are to be in the world, but the world is not to be in us. Our good works will not earn access to heaven for one single minute. But we must demonstrate good works before those who do not know Jesus, or else they won't be convinced that it's real. Jesus put it this way, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father 
who is in heaven. Michael W. Smith put it this way, share the gospel wherever you go, and if needed, use words. I'm one who believes we have to use words. We should live in such a way that when people see our lives, they want to meet our master. The question is, are you accomplishing the mission on this planet? Are you living a different lifestyle than those who don't know Jesus? That's our job as aliens. We have a mission to accomplish, sharing the good news with everyone on earth. But Peter says we should be about our mission without delay for a very important reason, and it's simply this, that we are facing a deadline. If you look at chapter, I mean, uh, verse 12, it says that we should glorify God on the day that he visits us. What does that mean? It means one of these days that Jesus is coming back. The return, the rapture, then the second coming. The Bible makes it clear that Jesus Christ is God. When Paul writes to Titus and he says the same thing Peter's writing here, because Jesus is going to return. It's important we live godly lives as an example to the people who are living here. The Bible says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and live lives of self-control, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait on the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tidings 2, verses 11 through 13. We know. We know Jesus is coming. But the fact is, we don't know when. We just know that he is. Some deadlines have identifiable dates. If I mention this date to you, it will probably seem panic and fury up your spine. But April the 15th is a deadline. But you know, it's really not that much of a deadline because millions of people file for extensions and they just move the deadline till a later time. A CPA told me about 25% of his clients file extensions. But you can't file an extension for the return of Jesus. If you're not a Christian, there'll be no way to file an extension or have another chance to accept the grace of God. For those of us who... Who are aliens our job is faithfulness because too we don't know the deadline but you can be assured of this Jesus is going to keep his promise during World War II the Japanese were overrunning the Philippines and it was because of the obvious fact that the Allied forces were going to fall and so General Douglas MacArthur ordered was ordered to leave in one of the most famous military speeches ever given on February the 22nd, 1942, General MacArthur said this, the President of the United States ordered me to break through the Japanese lines and to proceed from Corregidor to Australia for the purpose, as I understand it, of organizing the American offensive against Japan. A primary objective of which is the relief of the Philippines. I came through and I shall return. Most of you older, my age and older, are familiar with those words. But you may not be aware of the rest of the story. The remaining American forces and the Filipinos faced death and hardship by the occupying Japanese. At times, it must have been very difficult for them to believe that MacArthur and the Americans would return. To encourage them, our War Department prepared cigarette packs with MacArthur's words printed on the bottom, I shall return. Of course, this is before we knew that cigarettes could kill you. Thousands of these packs of cigarettes were airdropped and smuggled into the Philippines. And whenever someone read those words on the bottom of the package, they were reminded of General MacArthur's promise. These words gave them hope for three years of Japanese occupation. Though thousands died before he returned, true to his word, General MacArthur returned to the Philippines on October the 20th, 1944. Less than a year later, he received unconditional surrender of the Japanese Empire. 
19 centuries before a man promised to return. A commander in chief of this universe. The Lord Jesus made that promise. Oh no, we don't need cigarette packages because we have his word. And almost every page it is him saying, I will return. I will return. And that should give us hope. We don't fit aliens in this world. They think differently. They talk differently. They act differently. And listen to me. That's to be expected. Because you and I are aliens. We have a mission. Let's take them to our leader. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's live a life of love and forgiveness in front of them so that they'll realize there's something different about us. Let's be busy doing it now because it's true. Jesus is coming again. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for him dying for us and making us aliens of a of a new place called heaven. Thank you, Lord, for empowering us through the wonderful Holy Spirit that we might live a different life, that we might love in a different fashion, that we might share a message not only of concern but one that is expedient because Jesus is coming. Thank you, Father, for loving us. May we love you in an incredible manner this next week as aliens on this planet. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. I hope you have an outstanding week. Join us again here at church on Wednesday at 6 o'clock. We can't wait to see you.